Good evening to everybody. It's good to see you all out this Monday night. And, and uh, hello. <laughs> Glad you made it out tonight, and we're excited to see what God has in store for us. We're uh, excited to have Brother Worley uh, tonight and, and uh, present what's going on in Amsterdam. Uh, give us what God's laid on his heart. And so, again, we're thankful for, the, for you being here. Let's pray, and we'll get this service going. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. I thank you so much for uh, just the blessings you've given us in our life, Lord. We thank you for the, the grace and mercy you've poured out, Lord. We thank you so much uh, for this church, God. Thank you for the people that have made it out tonight. And I pray that uh, you would just pour out a great blessing uh, in each of our lives tonight, Lord, through your word. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you would knit our hearts together, uh, that you would do something great uh, in this mission conference and through it, Lord, that we would uh, be more engaged in missions than we were when we started. And, Lord, moving forward, we would uh, realize how important it is to encourage and strengthen and, and help and, and uh, serve and uh, do everything we can do to advance your kingdom, Lord. And, um, Lord, we just ask that you move now and bless the song service and, and bless the message tonight and the speaker. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand with us, let's sing. <clears throat> I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, many arrows pierce my soul from without within, but my Lord leads me on, through him I must win, oh I want to see him, look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace, on the streets of glory. the offering and get this missions conference going tonight. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this day, Lord. I just thank you for this opportunity to come before you and, uh, and be in this house. Lord, I just pray a bless tonight. I pray a bless Brother Worley as he's here and he presents the message, Lord, and we'll be able to see the work that, that you're doing over in Amsterdam through them, Lord. Lord. I just pray for this offering. You'll bless this offering. Bless the gift and the giver, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
stand? Breaks through where there was one there. Now- 
God, man. That's awesome. I love that song. Love that song? It means that she was singing about you and me. Each voice, another chance to reach the world. So praise God. That's awesome. Were you blessed last night? Were you here last night? You hear the, uh, the message from Pastor Hughes? 40 years later, man, 40 years later, still stirring souls, still stirring hearts. And, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll catch that vision, get God's vision, and realize that God has given us a voice. He's given us an opportunity to reach the world. And, and where we can't go, he calls others to go and, and reach the world. And this is she's saying, man, across the mountains, across the sea, each voice in harmony. Amazing grace is still amazing grace, no matter what language it is. And, and God gives us that opportunity to say it. So... Thank you again for being here. Once again, I, I'm excited about tonight, and uh, I'm going to ask Brother Ryan to come up here and uh, introduce our speaker. So, love you guys. Good evening. I'm really excited about the person that's about to speak, and it was really exciting to us to be able to start supporting him this year. And he can actually go thank Scott Marsh, probably for that. We've, uh, we've always had a desire to support y'all's work for a long time, and it just kind of renewed that excitement when uh, Scott Marsh's family came and presented, and they're coming to join their team, and just renewed our desire, and so it was exciting we were able to support you. And, uh, you know, every, every work, every missionary, there's no two works that are the same. Every people, or every people group is different, every city is different, so it's neat to see different works all around the world and how they're different and how the Lord is using different people, different circumstances to accomplish his work. And be praying for, uh, for Brother Kevin here. He's going to be flying back right after the missions conference. Uh, he's been away from his family for nine weeks now. So I know all of us would be, have a hard time. So be praying for him these last couple days. Pray for his safe travel. He'll get back quickly. Without further ado, Brother, if you'd like to come share the word and what you're doing. Thanks, Ryan. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Trinity, for having me uh, be here and be a part of this week. I appreciate it. I, uh, we still haven't uh, settled on exactly when the last time uh, my family and I were here, uh, about four years ago, I think. Um, we came back for a short furlough this summer. Uh, the kids finished up with school the middle of July, and so we came back, and uh, they were here with me in the States until uh, the very end of August and uh, they had to head back so they could start school. And so I, I stayed here to, uh, to tie up some loose ends and visit several churches in the great state of Texas. And I uh, appreciate the warm weather that y'all are having down here. It was 34 degrees when I left Missouri on, uh, uh, what was that, Saturday morning. And I got here and it was about 85 and it was so nice. So I appreciate that. We uh, have been in Amsterdam now for two years. Uh, just celebrated our second anniversary there. Um, God first called us to be church planting missionaries in the city of Amsterdam in 2003. At that time, I was uh, a general manager for a company in Springfield, Missouri. I worked for my father-in-law, actually, and uh, enjoyed um, business and the different aspects of that. And uh, really, uh, my wife and I were both saved when we were young, but I I never imagined that God would call us into the ministry. I never considered myself a minister. I just, uh, you know, I just, I grew up in church, and I just, uh, I didn't foresee that being something that God would have for me. And, uh, you know, when, when I was a kid, the thing I hated most about uh, those school assignments was when you had to get up in front of people and talk. Really, like, you get the assignment, like, six weeks ahead of time, and then for six weeks, I'm just sick about it the whole time. God has a sense of humor, so that's the job he gave me, was to, to spend lots of time in front of people, and, and it's by God's grace that you know, I actually kind of enjoy it now. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. I don't know. We'll decide on how, how good a job we, that's all come together later. But uh, in 2003, my family and I, we just had prayed for a long time, and, and it was funny that uh, when, uh, when I found out that we were going to watch the video by uh, uh, Brother Hughes, uh, that we watched last night when I found that out uh, back earlier on uh, late spring when we first uh, talked about uh, me being here this week. Uh, it was actually through the testimony of Bob Hughes that God really touched our hearts and confirmed what he was calling us to do. Incidentally, Bob Hughes is the father of my pastor's wife at home. My home pastor 
her father is Bob Hughes, or was Bob Hughes. And so uh, they, uh, my pastor and his wife, were missionaries in the Philippines as, as kids. They went back as adults, and then God called them to, uh, back to Springfield to pastor my home church. And really, the testimony of what Bob Hughes, the level of surrender in his life really uh, just impacted us heavily. And just uh, God really spoke through that and challenged us to, to take a step and to trust him with some things that uh, we previously just had not maybe uh, considered. And uh, I'm very thankful for that testimony. And, and I was challenged again last night as I heard uh, the voice of a man that God called to the Philippines. You, if you think back, when God called Bob Hughes to the Philippines, God had been at work in the Philippines long before he called Bob Hughes. But when we look at what was going on in the Philippines prior to that time, uh, the gospel seeds had yet to be sown in the hearts of the people of the Philippines. When we look at the Philippines today, and I hear reports from missionaries, and my mind has, I honestly has a little bit of a hard time processing the numbers of people that I hear coming to, to, to Christ in the Philippines. I hear about the, the testimony of what God is doing in countries like China, where thousands and tens of thousands of people coming to the Lord every day. That's exciting. But somebody had to go and sow the seeds in China and the Philippines generations ago. Bob Hughes is, a, is our example in that respect. The Netherlands is a country of almost 17 million people. Amsterdam is the capital city of the Netherlands. Almost 2 million people live in, uh, in the capital city of Amsterdam. Less than 1% of the people that live and work in Amsterdam today would tell you that Jesus Christ is forgiven of their sins and that they have been saved and they're a child of God. Less than 1%. Another point of reference would be the fact that in a city of 2 million people, roughly the size of Saginaw, 2 million people, not quite, almost 2 million people, in a, in a relatively small city. I can ride my bike from the far south end of town to the far north end of town in about 15 minutes. And that's just riding with traffic. That's not getting any kind of hurry. I'm not a super bicyclist. That's just me on my bicycle going somewhere. We don't have a car. Um, it's really, it's sometimes maybe more work to have a car than not have a car. In a city that's that crowded, traffic, as you can imagine, is pretty, uh, pretty crazy. So it's not a big city, a lot of people crammed into a little space, 174 languages spoken in that city, people from all corners of the globe. As we look at the, 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 the different breakdowns of uh, the different hemispheres and, 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 and continents and the representation there of the people that are there, people from all four corners gathered together in a little city like Amsterdam. That provides a pretty unique opportunity for us. And uh, we're excited to be there and just to be able to, to see what God is doing and, and how he's working. And, you know, sometimes I'm, I have to admit I'm tempted to think that maybe, uh, and, and I hear people say this from time to time, that, that, that they're praying that God would be at work in, in Amsterdam. And I think sometimes the assumption is because there's so few churches in that city, I, I'd say my estimate would be that there's probably on a weekly basis about five churches in that city preaching the gospel to two million people. How many churches do we have just right here within three or four blocks? I mean, I think that's fantastic. I love the fact that we have access to the gospel and, and that sort of thing. But when, when you start thinking about the task that lays before us, if we want the Netherlands to be the next Philippines or the next China where thousands of people are coming to Christ and somebody has to go and sow the seeds. We have just a short video that we're going to look at. Uh, this is basically what I, what I hope to accomplish with this video is to kind of set the stage. To just real quickly in about four and a half minutes, let's, let's, let's take a quick look and see what the cultural um, obstacles are in a country like the Netherlands. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how maybe that relates to us here and draw some examples from Scripture and see what we can learn as we work together to uh, share the gospel with the world. So if we have that ready, go ahead. God? Yeah. Who is this guy? I don't know him. He doesn't exist. I believe there's something, but I don't believe there's a God. Today, Europe is a dark, post-Christian continent, but remains more than ever 
a powerful world influence. I think there is something, but I don't think it is God. I believe in him or her or it in the cosmos, but I don't believe in something like God. Its countries represent the largest economic trading bloc in the world. Its ethnically diverse population of 750 million will powerfully influence world politics and economics well into the 21st century. There is something, but I don't know about Jesus. He was a nice Jewish guy, but he was murdered. Too bad for him. Two world wars and social experiments like fascism, communism, and socialism has created a self-centered and cynical society. I don't believe in all the, the stories. I don't think he ever existed. Everything is suspect. Church is irrelevant. And in the minds of many Europeans, Christians are an outdated past that hinders enlightened thinking progressive humanistic ideals. For the people uh, to give it a, a creation, I think they made a man of it. A secularized youth culture, the largest in Europe's history, struggles to find meaning. 25% of young people in Central and Eastern Europe are unemployed. Drugs, alcohol abuse, and abortion are common. Millions of unreached peoples from restricted areas pour into Europe from areas of the Middle East and North Africa making Europe a melting pot of peoples and ethnically diverse cultures. Less than 1% of Europeans are evangelical Christians. Europe is solidly post-Christian. The church in Africa is growing 50 times faster. Even Asia, 43 times faster than Europe. Europe remains one of the greatest and most significant mission fields on Earth. I don't believe in God. I don't believe there's a God. Who is this guy? I don't know him. He doesn't exist. Tonight we're going to look at uh, Acts chapter 17, and we're going to look at a, a missionary team. Um, Brother Ryan mentioned that uh, Scott Marsh, uh, Scott and Jessica were here just uh, a year or so ago, and um, Scott and Jessica are our partners. They're from our home church in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, they arrived in Amsterdam in June with their two little girls, and they've got one more on the way, so we're growing our church. It's just, uh, you know, through transplants and, and things like that. But uh, Scott and Jessica arrived in June. Uh, our, our college pastor, two years ago at our home church also, he and his wife surrendered to, uh, to come and be a part of what God is doing in Amsterdam. And just this summer, again, my, uh, the, the youth, I'm sorry, yeah, the youth pastor at our home church, uh, while we were back, we were able to kind of connect with them and get to know them. He's from... Hallmark Baptist here in uh, Fort Worth, uh, was raised here in Fort Worth, was on staff there as youth pastor for, for uh, a few years, moved to Springfield, and then just this summer, he, uh, in fact, about three and a half weeks ago, uh, he called me and he just said, hey, you know, you've been talking to me about Amsterdam, about what God's doing there, and he said, I, I got to tell you, I feel like God is calling us to come and be a part of what he's doing. We, we want to know, it, would it be uh, would we be able to join your team to come and plant a church in the city of Amsterdam? I said, well, of course, that would be, that would be fine, and, and more than fine. It would be amazing. And we started praying when God touched our hearts uh, in 2003. Uh, we weren't sure where we were going. We just knew God had called us, and so we began preparation. I resigned my position, the job that I was in. I went to Bible college. I didn't have a, a, a degree in theology. I had never been to a Bible college. I have a degree from a secular university, and so I went back to school and got a degree in, uh, in Bible and missions and theology, and, and uh, we began praying at that time. Once God began to slowly reveal His plan, included us going to a city like Amsterdam, that He would touch other people's hearts. Uh, we didn't know who that would be, um, and, and since that time, God has touched the hearts of three other families to come and be a part of what we're doing. And so we're excited. Uh, we've been there, as I mentioned, two years. And uh, during that time, we've been extensively studying the language. Uh, the language that's spoken there is Dutch. Um, sometimes that's confusing for people. Think German, really. It sounds German, very Germanic in origin. Um, but it's got some sounds that we just don't make in, in English. And so it's taking us a little bit of time, but it's going really well. 
Uh, our kids are all four in public schools. God totally worked that out. It was not our plan to put our kids in public schools. My oldest is, I have, my three oldest are boys, Jack, who's 16, Keaton, who's uh, 15, Reese is 12, and then our daughter, Nina, is 10. We really had planned on them being in some form of uh, international school. Uh, we just assumed, you know, of course, the language would be a huge barrier to being in public schools. And so uh, God just quickly began to show us once we got there that that was not his plan. All four of our kids are in public schools. So when they leave the house in the morning, they speak Dutch until they come home. They don't speak English at all during the day. And they've really picked it up well. My, my kids are fast learners, and God has been really gracious to them. And so our kids are in, 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 in really language school, but they're in public schools, and we are four days a week um, just doing language study, learning the language, learning to speak and hear and listen and read and write all over again. And it's going well. We're in the process right now of developing relationships bet with between 35 and 40 people. Uh, I mentioned that less than 1% of the people that live in, in, and work in Amsterdam are Christians. Um, that creates a little bit of a, a uniqueness in that we've come into a city to plant a church, and we're it. We showed up, and, and, in, and until just recently had not met another Christian. Uh, the video talks a little bit about um, Christians are viewed by much of Western Europe as being sort of uh, unlearned, uneducated, um, um, hindering enlightened thinking, I think, is the, is the verbiage that's used in the video. And that really is true. Christianity is, and when we talk about someplace being post-Christian, we know if we, if we study much history, we see that the, the preachers that came from Europe in, the, in, in centuries past and how, how we have a, a lot of our heritage comes from uh, people that came from Europe uh, centuries ago. But when you look at Europe today, most of it, particularly the further west and north you go, the less influence Christianity and the church is having on the culture at large. And so when we, when we get there and we meet people, they always want to know, well, what do you do for a living? And I always tell them, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister. And so they say, okay, well, why are you here yeah, well, we're here to start a church. God's called us here to start a church. And that usually, uh, I think they feel very sympathetic at that point because they assume maybe we didn't get the memo that church is not uh, something that we do here in Europe anymore. We have lots of church buildings, but nobody goes there. And so, you know, the, the sad thing is uh, the oldest church in the city of Amsterdam is in the center of the red light district, and it's not had a group of people that comes together and congregates there uh, for centuries. So it stands as a monument to, uh, to something. And so people, people, they say, well, you know, um, the church is, is an institution. They, they, think, uh, they think about their history books and they think about the Inquisition. They think about things that, that they know about the church and they look at the church today and all they see is bricks and mortar. All they see is uh, something that used to be, and it worked for maybe my grandparents, somebody my age would say, but, you know, we've, 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 uh, we've progressed to the point that we now know that the church is just, you know, it's just an institution. And I love to be able to share with folks that know the church is, is less about bricks and mortar and seats and hymnals than it is about people, people gathering together in community, people learning and and, and growing together and helping each other. That's something that's very uh, intriguing to them because if you, if you think about it and if you've traveled very much, you'll know that the more densely populated the area, the more difficult it becomes to develop interpersonal relationships. You would think that if you lived within, say, a, a block of, uh, I don't know, maybe 3,000 people, or say within a square mile there was... Um, 15,000 people. You would think, well, you, there's lots of opportunities there to develop relationships with people. But unfortunately, the more densely populated an area, the more difficult it becomes, the more isolated people become. It actually works in reverse. And so when we talk to people about community and about, you know, well, what are your needs? What are the things that, 
that really are heavy on your heart. People are just desperately lonely. Desperately lonely. They don't have relationships. They don't have people that they can call when they're sad or they're in need, when they're hurting, when they're questions. There's not a safe place to ask questions and share and to grow. And so when you begin to tell, when you begin to explain to people, well, the church is actually that kind of place. The church is where we come together and we learn and we grow and we we become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to go out and meet the needs of people, not just in our immediate surroundings, but beyond that. And we, we talk a lot about the Great Commission and, you know, going and, and into our Judea and Samaria and, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That begins with that relational, communal living that just, we just do life together. When we are able to share with people that, that Jesus came to be in relationship with us so that we could have we have this relationship with him, this, if you want to call it a vertical relationship with him, he's living in us. We, we, are, we are granted access to the Father by Jesus Christ. Now we have these lateral relationships, these that are represented here by the people that sit in these pews around you and the people that you live with and the people that you work with and the people that you know outside of this. People begin to open up a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And so, as I mentioned, about 35 to 40 people that God just has really begin, begun to knit our hearts together with these folks who don't know Jesus. They don't, they don't know the first thing about what salvation means for them and what God's plan might look like in their lives. And that, that, that it's not just God is just this idea or this philosophy or whatever People ask me a lot of times, they say, well, okay, what's the primary religion in the Netherlands? What's the, what, it, what is it? And, and that's tricky because historically, if you, uh, if, if you came from Holland, you were either Protestant or you were Catholic. You were one or the other. There was no in-between. And so people well, today, when you talk to them, you, when you, if you were to ask them and say, what is your religion? they would think, well, my parents or my grandparents went to the Protestant church, so I'm a Protestant, or my parents or grandparents went to the Catholic church, so I'm a Catholic. That makes me a Catholic. And so they might even at times refer to themselves as a Christian but have absolutely no understanding of what that really means in a practical sense. What, what relationship? Relationship with who? There is no God. So the religion really today isn't in your history books. It's not it's not one of the traditional things that we would think about. And what I really tell people, the honest truth is, we would say that they are pluralists. If, if, if that were a, a traditional type of religion, but really it's not. And a pluralist simply believes that, that uh, each person is, is entitled to their own opinion about what truth is and, and how it applies to each person, and that looks unique. So literally, if there's 150 people in this room tonight... We could sit around and we could talk about, I think this, I believe this, I'm, I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Well, I believe that Muhammad was a prophet and I believe this or that. I believe in one of the million different Hindu gods or, or, or I just believe that, uh, you know, God is in the trees or, you know, anything. We could all talk about what we particularly find to be true and no one would say, well, no, that can't be true. The interesting thing is that... Uh, you know, we give ourselves a little too much credit because the truth is pluralism is not new. In fact, it's just as old as anything. If you think back with me for just a minute, what is pluralism? It's replacing God's truth with something else. That's it. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, what was Satan's approach to Eve in Genesis chapter 1? What happened in Genesis chapter 3? God, Genesis chapter 1, God made man in his image. By Genesis chapter 3, Satan had come in and he said what? Yea, hath God said, right? He said, now, are you sure that what God said is really the truth? He said, I'm here to tell you that really maybe God is not just. Maybe God is not fair. and Maybe God doesn't love you like you think he loves you. Because if he did, he would have told you that you can be like your own God. Adam and Eve succumbed to pluralism. They replaced God's truth with something else. 
You know, sometimes those things sound really good, and I'm sure to Eve that sounded really good. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, that makes sense. So when people ask me, they say, well, what is the, uh, what's the primary religion? That's, that's the answer. It's, it's every man for himself. The Bible talks about that there will come a time when everyone will work that thing that seems right in their own eyes. They'll do, everyone will determine for themselves what is right and what is wrong. And so that's the kind of culture we live in. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 17. The interesting thing is, as we even visited just a little bit at dinner tonight, that there are evidences of that pluralism here in the United States. We'll host our first missions team in June of this coming year, June of 2013. We've scheduled a, a, a team of high school kids to come and be in Amsterdam for uh, about nine days. And uh, there are several things that we hope to accomplish in that time, but uh, one of the things that we hope to minister to these young people as they come is to be able to bring them into a culture that is much like what I believe the culture here in the United States will be in the next two and three and four years. You know, people used to say that, well, you know, Europe is a lot like America only in maybe 10 or 15 years. I don't really feel like we have that much time. Because we've all been exposed to those people who, oh, there's no God, or, you know, maybe there is, I'm an agnostic. Maybe there's a God, but there's really no way to know Him, and so you just have to be a good person, and, you know, it'll all work out in the end. We all know somebody that probably believes that way. There may be some here tonight that believe that way, that, well, I really just have to be good enough. I just have to be better than, than, than this person. And as long as there's somebody that's worse than me, I'm okay. And we, we, we tend to gauge our own righteousness on the people that sit around us instead of looking to Jesus Christ, who's the author and finisher of our faith. Acts chapter 17, I'll set this up for you. We're going to start in verse 16. We're going to read a big chunk, and then we're going to kind of go back and talk about it. But basically, what we have, beginning in verse 16, is was Paul was in Berea, and he was... He was working with Silas, and he was working with Timothy, and it got to a point in Berea where the Jews were so upset about what Paul was doing that they just, Paul had to flee for his life, and he left Berea, and he left, uh, he left Timothy and Silas behind. They, they said, we've got to get you out of here, Paul, and so they took him, and, the, and he left, and Paul went to Athens, and, and so Paul's intent once he got to Athens was to wait for Timothy and Silas to join him there and then move on. Paul was in the midst of his second missionary journey here when we find him in Athens, and we'll start reading in verse 16. And I'm going to read all the way down to almost the end of this section, so just bear with me. I want to read the whole thing. Verse 16 says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, and he saw, and when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them and that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him, and they brought him to, to, unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were, which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you too are superstitious. Paul says, I see that you're a religious type person, uh, a culture. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of all, uh, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times wherefore appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Basically, God set creation in order. He orders everything, the tide and the seasons. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, like they're groping in the dark. 
and find him. Therefore, or though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your poets have said. Paul's quoting uh, a recent uh, a poet here as he's talking. For we are also his offspring, verse 29. For as much then as ye were, are the offspring of God, ye ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and men's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in, which, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Verse 32. And when, he, and when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, oh, We will hear you again of this matter. And Paul departed from them. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We just thank you for uh, this evening that we have together, Lord, to open your word, that, we, that you are here with us, and that, that Jesus has given us access to you, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us. I pray that our hearts would be open and our minds would be alert to receive a word from you tonight, Lord. I pray that you would just just uh, move in our hearts and you would teach us, Lord, that we would be teachable in a way, Lord, that you were able just to reveal truth to us, that you would be magnified and glorified above everything, and that this week, Lord, would be about Jesus and about what Jesus has done for us and how, Lord, you've just chosen to include us in what you do to save souls. Lord, thank you so much for saving us. Thank you for Jesus, and thank you for the blood of Christ, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully by May, Corey and Kaylee will be able to join us, and there'll be three of us there in the city of Amsterdam. Right now, what we're doing primarily is just meeting people where they are, understanding that everybody that is doing life in that city has needs, they have fears, there's anxiety about things, some people are depressed. Uh, the truth is, everybody needs the gospel, and first and foremost, primarily, beginning and end, God has called us to that city for one thing, to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel, to be instant in season and out of season, to trust that God's word is sharp, it is quick, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it will do its work in each man's heart. God has called us there to preach the gospel. One of the things that I, I learned very quickly was, I understand, okay, God, I understand that, you, that Jesus said that that the first thing that I'm supposed to do, my responsibility to God the Father, the way that I glorify Him is to love Him with all my heart, all my soul, and all my strength. I also know that Jesus said that the second, the second command that is like that is to love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting to me that we see that, that instruction, and then if you think about it for just a second in terms of a marriage, a man and a woman, we see in Scripture that husbands are are encouraged and, and, and instructed to dwell with their wives according to knowledge. Why is that important? Why is it important that a husband know his wife and study his wife and understand his wife, even though sometimes that's really difficult? Amen? Sometimes that's hard. Loving people is hard. Jesus loved me. He went to the cross. That was hard. So we see the instruction is that husbands love your wives and dwell with them according to knowledge. Why is that important? Because he says later on in Ephesians, Paul says, Husbands, the biggest thing for you to understanding the church and understanding your role as a man is to understand that you are to love your wife the way that Jesus Christ loved you, loved the church, and gave himself up for it. My first responsibility is to love my wife. As a missionary, my first responsibility is to love my wife. As a pastor, my first responsibility is to love my wife. After my relationship with God, my first responsibility is to love my wife. My second is to love my kids, to teach them and to train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. After that, I believe God's called me to pastor and lead this team of, of four families. But I, I see the opportunities that God gives me to, to interact with people on a daily basis and to speak truth into their lives. But the thing that I, as, as much as I want to go out and I want to tell them, you know what, you need Jesus you have sin in your life and you need to be forgiven. You're separated from God. The reason that you have this, this frustration in your life, the reason that you're so sad, the reason that you're depressed, is because you're trying to live your life without Jesus, separated from God by your sin. That's what I want to tell them. 
But if I reflect back on what the Bible says about my ability to love somebody is directly linked to my understanding of that person. If I don't know my wife, I might say, for instance, if I didn't know that really the thing that is very important to her is for me to speak words of affirmation to her, to tell her, hey, I'm just crazy about you. I love you. Uh, man, I really appreciate what you do for our family. If I don't understand that, I might go out and I might buy her flowers. Because I might think, you know what? I, I would appreciate it if somebody would buy me flowers. Not, maybe not a good example, but I, 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 like, I like flowers, I guess. All the while, I've missed the point in that God has said, love your wife, study her, know her to the point that you will know that what's important to her is this and not that. And so, as we have been there now for two years, we've been studying people, listening to them. Yeah, think about that. Imagine that. Listening to people when they talk. Making room in our life and in our home so that people feel like this is your home. You are really welcome here. We want you to come in and we want to share our food with you. We want to, we want to know you so that we can love you. I was told by one of the ladies as we've gotten to the point now where we're sharing Christ on a, on a daily basis, I never, I shared this with the Sunday school class the other day, I have yet to have to walk up to somebody and say, can I talk to you about Jesus? I, I've never had to do that. They always beat me to it. Now tell me a little bit more about this. You told me, you said, you said this, and I'll, I have a question. I don't agree with that. I want to talk about this. So I think this, okay, let's talk about it. I'm not afraid of your questions because God doesn't fear your questions. We want to build a relationship, and that includes sometimes hearing things that we don't want to hear and seeing things that we don't want to see. And you know what? Sometimes having people in our home that we don't want in our home, it's, it's tough to be, just, to be completely honest, but it's amazing as we study these people and as we listen to their life story, and we hear them talk about the things that are going on in their life, how God just says, here, share this, do this, and people are responding. You know what? I don't know one Christian in that city. I don't. I know a couple of guys who pastor some churches, but outside of that, I don't run into people who are Christians. And so uh, I, right now, that's what we're doing, but I see people becoming more and more and more receptive to the gospel. Where it used to be really quick, nope, we don't talk about that, nope, I don't, no, I don't believe that, no, I don't like that, I don't want to. Now it's more of a, well, what about this? You know, I'm, what does happen? You know, the question is, well, what if there really is a hell? That's what somebody said to me one evening. You know, I think about that. You know, the truth is, you didn't think about that, the Holy Spirit laid that on your heart. The Holy Spirit laid that on your heart. God's at work in the hearts of these people. I believe that with all my heart. My prayer is that God would save them and he would use them to save others. That there would be a church planting movement that would spread across Europe. Today, more people live in cities than at any other time in history. People are moving in. Used to be people in the 1970s here in the States, people lived in cities and crime and the cost of living. Everybody moved out, and we saw people leave my church, my home church. That was kind of what happened. We were right in the middle of town, and, man, everybody left. And we relocated our church in 1978. Today, people, we're seeing urban redevelopment projects and all kinds of things where people are going in, and they're trying to reclaim the, that abandoned property, and they make it loft housing, and they make you know, different things like that. People are moving into cities quickly. There are all kinds of projections on what, what the future looks like in terms of how many people will live in cities as compared to how many people live r more rurally. People are moving into cities, and, and it's amazing. God called us to a place where He already knew that He was going to be gathering people together, that He was already at work in their hearts, and that there were going to be people. Our prayer is that we say church planter. That's, I don't know, maybe that's some, maybe a new word for some, but really, I mean, it's just planting a church in a culture where there is not a church. But we want, not only want to do that, we want to plant churches that plant churches that plant churches. Really, it's, it's, it's Jesus in Matthew chapter 28. He said, go and teach people to do what I taught you to do. 
model before people what I've modeled for you. What, what, what did he do? He had about 12 people, 12 guys that he was pretty close with. There, was, there were some other people on the fringe, maybe 75 or 100 people. But in that group, there was really three guys that he spent the primary amount of his time walking with them, eating with them, talking with them, learning and growing and, and all the, doing life with those people. That's what he was doing. But his command was to, okay, now you've seen what I've done. Now go and do likewise. Go and reproduce yourself in other people. Make disciples. Teach them and train them to do what I have taught and trained you to do. If we look back at our text, we see that, that the, one of the first things that Paul does in, in, in verses 22 and 23, he says, uh, that he stood in the midst of Mars Hill and he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you two are superstitious or religious. He said, For I passed by and beheld your devotions, and I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Paul says, Look, I see, I see that you are very religious. I see that there are certain things that you are attempting to do to make peace with God on your own. So Paul is identifying that, that there, are, there are some things that they're doing on a relig- in a religious nature. In other words, they're regularly doing it. They're, 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 they're trying to approach God uh, on their terms. One of the interesting things is, if you think about it for a minute, if you look and you see in, in, in Genesis, what, what was God saying in Genesis chapter 1? He said, let us make man in our what? Let us make man in our image. What was it that, that was representative of God's image? What do we know about God? If we read through the Gospel of John, we see that in John chapter 15, 26, we see that the role of the Holy Spirit is to testify to Jesus. John chapter 16, verse 14, we see that the, whole of the, 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 the role of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son. John chapter 17, verse 1, we see that God the Father and Jesus glorify one another. People tell me a lot, they'll say, well, okay, you're you're a religious person. I'm not a religious person. We talk to them about worship when when we say, you know, we talk about worship and I worship God and what that means, obedience and a lot of what we talked about on Sunday, Pastor Kyle talked about on Sunday, obeying, obedience. People will say, oh, well, you, okay, so you worship and I don't. And I love it when you turn the tables on somebody and you get them to think about something that they never considered. And you're able to share with them, well, you know, the truth is, we were all created to worship. You can't not worship. The atheist, the agnostic, the Buddhist, the Hindu, we were programmed when we were created by God in His image to worship. We're just worshipers. Unfortunately, we've exchanged the truth for a lie, and many worship created things rather than the Creator. When you're able to talk to somebody about, oh, well, they say, well, I'm not religious. In other words, I don't want to hear about your religion. Great, I'm not religious, and I'm not here to sell you a religion. What do you mean? I thought you were a pastor. Yeah. So why are you here? To preach Jesus Christ and love you to figure out what that means. So when you're able to tell somebody, hey, you know what? You worship and I worship. It's just what we worship. Many of us, we worship our careers. The things that are, how do, how do you know, what is it that I worship? If, if, if this is true, then what do I worship? And it's easy. You just say, well, what do you fear? All through Scripture, the only thing that we're ever directed to do as followers of Jesus Christ is to fear one thing, God. So you, all you have to do is ask somebody, well, if you don't worship, then you must not fear anything. Well, no, you know, well, so what do you fear? Well, I fear, you know, whatever. And you could fill in the blank with just about anything, rational or irrational. People fear everything. I fear losing my job. I fear losing my wife. I fear uh, losing my kids. I fear that I'm not going to make enough money. I'm, I fear I'm going to be homeless. I fear I'm not going to be able to make my car payment. I, I, I fear that my, my parents won't accept me, or I fear this, or... Uh, and the list is endless, and everything that you can put in that category, that is what you worship to one degree or the other. To be able to share that with somebody who lives in a culture who said, yeah, I, 
yeah, I don't do that. Well, what is the truth? The truth is, yeah, you, you know in your heart, when you lay in bed at night by yourself and you're alone with your thoughts, there's something that scares you. There's something that you're looking for freedom from. What is that thing? So Paul's ministering in a pluralistic culture already. He's basically, he's, he's seeing this and he's, he's in Athens. And in, in, in Athens at this time, Athens would have been the center for learning, really the world's center for learning at this time. They were thinkers. They were Stoics. There were men who, they just, you know, it says here in our text that they kind of just sat around and they were eager to just hear the new thing. What's the new thing? What does that sound like? You know, what's the new YouTube video? What's the latest funny thing you saw? What was the latest funny commercial you saw? Where's the last great place you ate at? What's the new car? What's Oprah reading now, right? It's... It's very much like what we see now. And we, we like to think that, oh, well, we're, we're enlightened and we have these new things and these new ideas. They're just recycled. It's the same thing. We're still dealing with the same thing that Paul was dealing with then. So what do you do? What does that look like? Well, one of the things that Paul did, it says here in verse 17, the first part of verse 17, it says, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with devout persons, and in the market daily, with them that met with him. So what did Paul do? It says he thought. He was thinking. He was reasoning. He was engaged in a dialogue with people. He was willing to hear, well, what is it that you think? Because that was their thing, talking about what they think and feel and how I perceive this or that. Paul, Paul was looking to engage these people, and so he began by just reasoning with them and talking to them. And that's the unfortunate thing is Christians a lot of times are considered to be, as I mentioned, just, well, Christians, they have this blind faith. You know, you just believe it and that's the end of it. You know, the truth is there are times where you don't have a choice. You just have to believe it because God said it. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit your thoughts to the Lord and he will, or commit your works to the Lord and he will establish your thoughts. What does that mean? It just means that sometimes you just got to do what God said to do, even though it doesn't make any sense. You know, for us, honestly, that was going to Amsterdam, part of it. Like, this doesn't make sense. Why would you call us to go here? I don't know anything about these people. I don't know what required, what's required to live there. I don't know what language they speak. I don't know what food they eat. I don't know where they do, what they do, what they don't do, what they like, and what they don't like. Why would you call me to do something like this? But Paul spent time. Where was he, incidentally, as this was going on? It says right here in verse 17, the first part of verse 17, he went into the marketplace. The Areopagus, Mars Hill, would have been the place where these men gathered together to talk. It would have been where business was conducted. They didn't have offices like we have offices today. Business was conducted in the gates. And in Athens, where Paul was, he was in the marketplace. One of the things that, that we're doing right now, and part of our plan is that we will, uh, as we go into a city again, where contextually the church is a very difficult concept for people to deal with, Two, two and a half, three years ago, and actually it's probably been a little longer than that, time slips away, it's probably been a little over four years ago, we began praying, God, what is it, what does ministry look like in a city like Amsterdam? Because people are, for the most part, pretty well off. Uh, the school system is a pretty good school system. There aren't a lot of homeless kids. In fact, I don't know if there's any. The birth rate is quite low, actually, in the Netherlands. Um... Okay, so what do I know about missions? I know that there's some pretty awesome tools out there. Brother Ryan, that's, he knows that. He knows that, you know what, the things that MANA does like feeding centers and orphanages and hospitals and, and schools and those kinds of things are great tools for a missionary. And so I, that's one of the things I knew. And so I, I know Bruce O'Neill, and I, I've spent a lot of time getting to know him, the director of MANA. And, and uh, I started thinking, well, what does that look like for us? What are the tools that are available to us Man, does it, right on the surface, I don't know what I can do in terms of a feeding center. I'm not sure how much impact that would have. I, I think long term, even just being here briefly in, in talking with, with Brother Ryan, I think, you know, really there's probably more potential for manna in that city than, than maybe I first thought. They're becoming more and more diverse in the way that they are ministering. And, but I looked at it and I said, God, what does this look like? And, 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 and I was uh, struck by this passage that, as Paul was in Athens, he was engaged in the daily conducting of business. He was in the marketplace. He was where people were on a daily basis. He was where the men gather. 
And so we began praying, and God laid on my heart this idea of a, a space within the city. Uh, if you just kind of can uh, maybe picture like a Starbucks for a minute, but not just limited to coffee. We want to be able to have a space like that where it is a, a, an inviting area where people can come in, but we want to have some books. We want to be able to partner with churches and people who say, you know what, um, when I was uh, growing in my faith, I read this book. Maybe, now, for instance, a book like Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis or something like that that you know, really was influential in my, my, my coming to Christ. And, and I read that book, and you know what? I want to be able to uh, say for $20, I can take a copy of that book, and I can put it on a bookshelf in that, in that bookstore. And as, as we are in the marketplace and people come in and they're there on a daily basis and we begin to get to know these people, these new people, to be able to say, you know, what is the pain in your life? What's going on? Well, the truth is I, I, I'm at a, uh, I am at a crossroads in my life and I've got these things. And to be able to say, hey, you know what? Here's this book. I don't know. Have you ever read this? You know, are you familiar with this author? No? Okay. Um, you know what? If you'll take this book and read it, uh, you can have it. It's my gift to you. If you would just, when you're done reading it, come back and let's just talk about it. Maybe you hate it. Maybe you don't like it, but we could just talk about it. It's yours. You take it. But to be able to ideally communicate with the person who sacrificially gave to put that book on that shelf, that $20, to be able to pull the card out of that book that we put in there that has your email address on it, that person, and be able to say, hey, incidentally, uh, a guy named Remco came in today to the bookstore, and this is kind of his thing, and uh, he took a copy of the book that you sponsored with him. Pray for Remco. Pray for this man. Pray that God would use this, that he would be working on his heart, that he would be drawing him to himself, that he would come back, and that we would have an opportunity to share Jesus Christ with Remco. You know, maybe Remco comes back, maybe he doesn't. It's $20. It's an investment. You know what? It, to pray for somebody that you don't know, when God answers prayers, we've seen God answer prayers. When you pray for somebody you don't know, you have no connection to that person, you have nothing to gain by that person's prayer, that prayer that you've offered up, other than you just feel like God has laid it on your heart to pray for that person. How awesome is it when you find out <laughs> God totally answered that prayer? That's part of what we want to do, to be able to be involved in the marketplace through what we're calling Word Bookstore. I struggled uh, for a little while because I thought, you know, Lord, I'm there to plant a church. What do you mean open a bookstore? This doesn't make sense. Uh, this is a lot of money, and I'm not sure churches are going to buy into this. And I don't know if, if we're going to be able to raise this money. And I put together a budget, and you can look at it on the table back there. It's in a, a prospectus. And in that prospectus, you'll see that our budget for 18 months of opening and running a bookstore, coffee shop, place, in Amsterdam is $180,000. That's like, that's like a nice house, right? I could probably come to, I don't know, Fort Worth and buy a pretty nice house for $180,000. I don't know. That's a lot of money. And so I started thinking of reasons why, oh, that can't be, that's not right. You know what, God just kept, no, I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. I don't like that. Do you like that when God says, just trust me? I don't like that. I didn't like it very much, but I said, okay. Commit your works to the Lord and not. He will establish your thoughts. All right, I'm, I know what you told me, so uh, I'll, I'll pray about it, and I'm going to do my best to raise this money. We tried, and we didn't have a lot of success, honestly, for about the first six months. And so I started thinking, man, this is going to be years down the road. And uh, this summer we were home. We stay in my in-law's basement when we're in, uh, when we're in Springfield, when we're not on the road, we're not traveling. And so uh, it was a Wednesday evening uh, in the uh, middle of August. My father-in-law came in from the mailbox. He'd been at work all day. He came in, he had the mail, and he went through it, and he said, oh, here's an envelope for you. It came in the mail. Okay. Looked like an anniversary card to me from somebody, one of our family members or something, so I just, I didn't even touch it. I just left it. Well, it came time to go to church, and so we're getting the kids out the door, and, you know, Brittany went out in front of me, and as I turned to turn out the light, I saw that card, and so I grabbed it off the counter, and I walked out, and I got in the car, and as I started the car, I handed her the envelope, and I was backing out of the driveway, and she started to cry. She opened the envelope. There was a check in that envelope for $50,000 from a family member, somebody that we know that I didn't have any idea they had that kind of money. And I thought, man, that's amazing. And we were just worshiping and just like, wow, God, that's amazing. And it said on there, this is for Word Bookstore. So I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. I needed $180,000. Now I need $130,000. It's not a lot of difference to me. Even though $50,000 is a lot of money, you said a long way to go. We got to church, and 
And then when we got to church, my pastor came and he found me. He said, hey, um, Brittany was just about to go back to Amsterdam with the kids. And he said, hey, uh, I want you to come to my office right before service because I want to pray for you and Britt as she goes back with the kids, just that God would bless her and protect her. Oh, okay, that sounded like my pastor, so I didn't think much about it. Came time for the meeting. We went in and I and, uh, walked in and my father-in-law was there and all the members of our missions committee. And there were a couple of deacons and my, uh, the missions pastor. My head pastor was there and then some of the other... Uh, the O'Grady family that's, that's coming to join us in June was there. And I walked in, and I thought, well, this is a lot of people to pray for my wife to go back to Amsterdam. Well, we've done this before, and we haven't had a whole big outpouring of prayer. And I started to think, and I was like, um, I must have really messed up. I, I've done something, I've offended somebody, and I'm about to get canned. That's really what I thought was coming. I was like, I don't, I don't know what to make of this. And my pastor, he shut the door, and he said, well, Kevin, I just want to let you know that... Uh, you know, we had somebody call the church this week, and um, they found your website, and they're very interested in what you're doing and your vision for ministry in Amsterdam. And so uh, they asked us, they said, well, if High Street, they said, how much money has High Street contributed to, to Project 514 and Word Bookstore? And my pastor, uh, he said, unfortunately, we're just not in a position where we can do much for them right now. And so we've only been able to give them $1,500. And we're glad that God provided that, but that's been the extent of what we've been able to do. And and this person said, well, if you had $50,000, would you give it to them? And my pastor said, well, of course we would. We would we'd gladly do it. We feel like God is, is, has directed their steps and he's blessing them. And so that was the end of their phone conversation. And, he said, and the person on the other end of the line said, I don't know who that person is. The person said, well, there'll be a check in the mail. And my pastor was assuming that it would probably be for $50,000. The check came, it was for $150,000. He said, well, I guess, uh, I guess you're supposed to go open a bookstore. <laughs> and I said, well, that's, that's what we're going to do. And so we're headed back. I'm headed back now to join my family and uh, the marshes. And, and, and our prayer is, even though that date of June of 2013 that I put on there that I thought, there's no way. There's no way. I can't raise this money in, in a year. God said, hey, that's nothing. I got it. And it's funny how you can ask God for things, but then when he, he provides them, it surprises us. God was at work in the hearts of these people in a city like Amsterdam long before I ever thought about going there, long before he ever laid it on our hearts to go and be a part of what he's doing there. Paul was in the marketplace. Verse 18, if you look at verse 18 in this passage, we see that... Uh, Basically, says this, said the certain philosophers and, and of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he what? He preached. What did he preach? He preached Jesus. If you skip down to the end of this section, you'll see that verse... Um, Verse 32 says, When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, eh, some mocked. And others said, oh, We'd like to hear again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. You know, we go to a city like Amsterdam. As we live in a city like Fort Worth, we have things in common. One of the things is, is we all live in a pluralistic society. What does it look like to minister to... To minister in a pluralistic society, we see Paul's example here. He went into the marketplace and he preached Jesus Christ. He preached Jesus. He wasn't ashamed of it. He preached Jesus Christ. And you know what the truth is? I want, when I preach Jesus Christ, I want everybody to respond. There's 16 and a half million people in the Netherlands. I want all of them to hear the gospel and respond. But as we see from Paul's writing here at the, at the end of the chapter, you know what? Some people are just going to mock. Some people are going to say, oh, whatever. Yeah, you're just a babbler. Yeah, it's just this new thing that you're talking about, whatever. Some people, oh, I'd like to hear more about this. What is this? Can we maybe have coffee next Thursday? Because I have some questions. Well, how does this look like for me? What does this mean for me? You know what? And there's going to be some people who just say, yeah, man. And they're going to cleave. They're going to come and they're going to be a part of this community, the body of Believers gathered together for preaching and teaching and fellowship and encouragement and 
going out and meeting needs in this community. It's exciting, really, when you think about it, because I think we're all keenly aware of the things that we don't do well, right? Like, you just, we have these things that, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not a very good swimmer. I'm not a very good public speaker. I'm not a very good, you know, whatever. You know, and God says, uh, really, you're really not all that important in the whole work of what I'm doing here. But where does the fruit come from? Yeah, just preaching the word. What does it mean? Sometimes it's just, here's the truth, and you need to hear it. And sometimes it's, man, I'm really sorry. I hate to hear that you lost that loved one. That breaks my heart. We see in Matthew, Jesus said, weep with those that weep and mourn with those that mourn. Sometimes preaching the gospel isn't preaching the gospel. It's, man, come here, let me just love you. I hate that for you. You know what? The Bible says this. The Bible says that Jesus loves you. The Bible says that he sees your pain. He knows what you're dealing with, and he loves you. He knows what a screw-up you are. He knows how you failed. He knows all the things that you don't well, and yet he chose you. And so, you know, really, when you think about it, there's not a whole lot on me except to look to him. My ability even to love God is a gift of God. I mean, that's humbling when you think about it. God said, hey, first thing, love me. Oh, by the way, you can't do that without me. But it's exciting, and it's amazing just, just to think about what the implications are for a culture like the one that we live in right here. And even the, 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 the people that sit together in this room can be involved through this cooperative effort to, to see people come to Christ who you'll never meet. People in the Congo, you'll never meet them. People in Amsterdam, you'll never meet them. But because of the way that we're able to develop a relationship with one another and work together and partner together for the, the fulfillment of the Great Commission to go and make disciples, you know, there will come a time. Well, there will come a time where you'll be able to say, you know what, I didn't have much. I, I did what I could do, and it wasn't much, and I prayed, and maybe that's all I could do. You know what? There's a part in this for all of us. There's nobody that gets to just say, well, you know, missions isn't my thing. Uh, we call it missions because it's God's mission. It's his purpose. It's his plan to receive glory for himself. There's not a, you know, there's no bench sitters. Some of us, we pray. That's all I can do. I, I, financially, I'm, maybe I, this is what I have. I don't have much, but this is what I have. God doesn't need your money any more than he needs your talent, but he will use both for his glory. And that's exciting. That's amazing. If you, if, you, if you would, just with me, bow your heads, and we'll pray, and then I'll, I'll turn the service over to Pastor Kyle. Lord, we love you. We're humbled. Yeah, for whatever reason, you choose to work in us and through us, that you love us and forgive us when we are unlovely, when we, when we make mistakes, and when we fail you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for including us. Thank you for inviting us to come and be a part of being ministers of reconciliation. What is that? Just to preach Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, to, to see people redeemed from their sin and their fear and their failure and, and given hope and peace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for, man, you humble me. Just that the fact that you would stoop to love me. Thank you for the people of this church. Thank you for the leadership. Thank you for the blessing that they are to, to missionaries, to myself. I pray that you would just give Pastor Kyle wisdom, Lord. I pray that you would just speak to our hearts and that you would just help us to identify through the Holy Spirit, Lord, what is the thing that you're asking us to trust you with. I pray that you would give us relationships and that we would steward those relationships, Lord, so that, that you would be magnified, Lord. And that you would, as we lift you up, as you are lifted up, Lord, that you would draw all men into yourself. That you would be at work in the hearts of the people that we love and that we know that need Jesus. The people that we work with, the people that we live next to, Lord. I pray that we would just see them come to Christ, Lord. That you would build your kingdom up in this city, Lord, and in this church, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we just humbly ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We all face 
difficulties in our life uh, as far as obeying the Great Commission and as we look at uh, what is facing and has been facing uh, the whirlies and the marshes and stuff, um, it's similar to what Paul was facing. And as he shared with us tonight, it's, it's simply a matter of obedience. And I think that's what the call was last night from the message from uh, Pastor Hughes and also tonight. Uh, what will we do? You know, we don't face uh, maybe the, the hardness of Amsterdam here in Fort Worth, but we have our own difficulties. Uh, and as he said, we can't reckon on our own abilities. We can't reckon on our own finances. Uh, but we've got to reckon just in, in what God has given us. And that's a call. And that's a, a commission to go and to do the work. And so if you'll stand with us tonight as he sings, I surrender all. Let's maybe pray, God, use me. No matter how difficult it may seem, just use me. Praise God again. Thank you so much for uh, being here tonight, Brother Worley. Thank you so much for that and, and sharing with us the, uh, uh, the work that God has, has called you all to and, and the work that he's um, put ahead of you. And, and we're going to continue to pray for them. Let's pray for them and, and uh, encourage them and strengthen them again. I want to encourage you with, with each of our families here tonight, uh, Brother Worley and, and uh, Brother Christian, Miss Sean, and, and Brother Ryan and Kim. Encourage them. 
and pray with them and uh, bless them, help them, uh, do whatever is necessary to uh, just be a blessing. Uh, and I know that God will bless you for that. Um, real quick, I want to say something about this each night so you can be praying. That's the main thing, uh, is, is our faith promise. And um, whatever God has, the, I read what, I'll read what it says at the top. It says, as the Lord has blessed me, I'm committed to supporting the mission work of Trinity Baptist Temple in the following way for the next year. And, uh, and so this is a commitment that you're making um, for the next year. Uh, to support missions, either on a weekly basis, a bi-weekly ba basis, or a monthly basis. And so be praying what God wants you to do. And um, it's, uh, I know it's going to be a blessing to you. And uh, so be praying about that. Also tonight I want to uh, introduce the region uh, that we're uh, presenting as Asia. And so up on the board there you'll see uh, the new missionary that we added, the the uh, Power, Powers family to Cambodia and, and uh, the rest of Asia there. So this is something we're asking you to do. If, if you've been here, you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, then we've got uh, four regions here. We're asking you to, to be praying uh, who it is that God might have you uh, to stand by this next year uh, to pray for. Now, let me explain this real quick. There's a question about that. This faith promise that, that you do is to support missions in general. Uh, when you take a stand on Wednesday night and you go stand by whatever region you feel like God wants you to stand by, that's not what this faith promise is about. Uh, the faith promise is, is, is giving to the church uh, missions, and that goes to support all of these uh, mission works. Uh, but what we're asking you to do is go beyond just simply giving money and make, a, make an effort to engage missions in a different way. And so we're asking you to, to stand by a region for the next year to, to pray for those, those names every day, call out. God, I pray that you would bless Ryan and Kim Jones in their work. God, I pray that you would help them and strengthen them, encourage them, and provide for them. God, I lift up Dan Powers to you, that you would give him the things and, and give them the things they need every day going through that list. And there's going to be prayer cards at each station and lifting those missionaries' names up to God every single day and uh, before the throne. So. Uh, that's part of it. The other part is on the cards, there's some email addresses for the ones that we have. And you can simply, you know, on a weekly basis or an everyday basis, whatever, whoever God lays on your heart, send an email to that, that missionary. Hey, I'm praying for you today. I just want you to know that somebody in Fort Worth, Texas loves you and is praying for you. And, um, you know, let us know if there's anything special we can pray for you about. If you become friends with them on Facebook, same thing. You know, hey, when's your kid's birthdays? What, what, what are some of the needs? What are some of the things you might like for Christmas? You know, when it comes Christmas time, the people on that list, maybe you say, well, I can't do it for everyone. Well, maybe just pray, God, is there a family that really needs a blessing at Christmas time that I'm, I'm choosing to stand by for this next year that I can send some gifts to and engage missions, make these missionaries they really feel like there's people that even, they're not even necessarily, they're sending church, but our brothers and sisters in Christ that really care for them and love for them enough to pray for them and to help them and, and to go beyond, you know, maybe $10 a week. And $10 a week is a lot, you know. Uh, but go beyond that and show more than just giving money and, and show an effort in that. So be praying about that. Is it, is it Asia that God wants you to stand for this next year and, and engage in, in that? And uh, so please be praying about that. Please be praying about what God would do for Faith Promise. And if I can have the missionaries go back to their tables at this time, go by and shake their hand and um, be a blessing to them tonight. Love on them. Encourage them. And um, I know it's, it's you know, 8.30, but hey, maybe you want to go get a cup of coffee with them or go buy them some dessert or something. And yes, I got that. And that was the next thing on the list is tomorrow night, 6 p.m., if you can make it here, please be here, Brother Worley. You heard a lot of what, about what's going on and what God's leading them to do. But you maybe have more questions like, you know, why, why I want to know more, why they're so closed off. Or what, what, what have you run into? What are some of the crazies that you're talking about? What is, what, you know, be here at 6. You'll be able to, in a, an informal way, he's going to be down here on the floor with everybody. Just ask the questions, you know, and he'll be able to answer any questions we may have. And, again, we just started supporting them this year, so let's get to know them. And at 6 o'clock tomorrow night, 7 o'clock will be the service. And again, thank you so much for being here. You guys are a blessing. I know you're tired. We've got another few nights of this, but I, I promise you, Wednesday night, 
by the time that we're done and, and we make a stand together as a church for whatever reason, a region that God has, has put on our heart, I believe God's going to do something awesome through this church. And, and I, I just want to say I love the kids being in here. I love, I love seeing the kids praying together and grabbing parents and grandparents and, and praying. It's an amazing thing to see kids uh, in church. And, and uh, I want to challenge you, whether you're a grandparent or a parent, these kids are looking at us. And how much do we care about the Lord who saved us? And how much are we willing to share that? Let, let these kids see that passion in us. And uh, let this mission conference do that uh, to us this week. Give us a passion for the, the Great Commission. So, again, thank you. I we'll hope to see you tomorrow night at 6, if not 7. And let's pray and dismiss. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, just the, the challenge that you've given us tonight. Lord, a, a, an example of a missionary who, who didn't feel uh, like he was qualified, didn't uh, feel like he had anything to offer, and, and didn't make sense that you would call him to the, to the Netherlands, Lord. He had a job, and uh, Lord, but uh, you have a work for him there, and you've, you've called them over there. You're, you're using them in a way already that's an amazing thing, doors being open, and now with this, uh, this in the marketplace, uh, being able to reach out. And, Lord, reach people that they might not be able to reach otherwise. And, Lord, I know to us we might not quite understand maybe why the approach like that because we can, we can talk to people here and, and, and they might be friendly and, and, and it might make sense for them to talk to us about it because we do have a church on every corner. And, uh, but for there, Lord, whatever your will is, and, God, you've provided a means for this a bookstore to happen, I pray that you'd bless it in an amazing way. I pray that there would be doors open and that lives would... Uh, receive the gospel and there would be an opportunity to see reproduction go on um, in a church planted and, and that church plant other uh, churches that plant other churches God I pray that that vision would be fulfilled Lord and I pray that you would fulfill that vision in our church God that we would get busy that we would start proclaiming the name of Christ that we would truly love people the way that you've loved us and uh, just care for them and share with them and and help them and uh, God just make us the body, the hands and feet that you want us to be to accomplish your mission. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would bless each family here. Such a blessing to come out. And I pray that you would use us. Just bless us tonight. Take us home safely. And we'll give you the praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen.